happy? It's Friday. End of synchronization week. OK, now that's a good idea. Let's have a round of applause for Friday. All right. It's Friday. We, get to actually, we all get a couple days off. So um, today we're going to finish up you know, synchronization week. And we're going to finish up synchronization week by talking about synchronization problems. So I am using problems in two different ways in that sense at the same time, because I can do that. Problems in terms of problems with synchronization. What are the things that can happen, the bad things that can happen when you try to synchronize your code? So we're going to talk about deadlock, uh, which I am guessing that everybody in this class will cr create a deadlock by the time they finish these assignments. If you don't, then you're not trying hard enough. Okay? And then priority inversion, which is a little bit more, uh, what do I say, more of an exotic synchronization problem. But we'll talk about it today, and it's, it's kind of a neat uh, case where there's an interesting interplay between scheduling, which we'll talk about next week, and synchronization, which we're finishing today. Do I hear music? Robert, we're having class now. <laughs> Can you turn off the tunes? Sure. Um, and then we're going to talk. We're going to work through together a sample synchronization problem. So we're going to walk through one example of a case where I have uh, a couple threads that need to be synchronized. And we're going to talk about, thank you. We're going to talk about, um, I, I wouldn't mind like having a background track for this class, right? Should we just start leaving the music playing throughout the entire class? You know, just a little, then we need some like very sort of like drum and bass electronica or something like that. That's something I can talk over. Um, maybe we'll experiment with that next week. Maybe not. So, and then we're, we're going to walk through this problem together. And I uh, decided to do one problem today. Uh, you will see more synchronization problems during recitations. Uh, next week, Sonali is going to be covering uh, several example synchronization problems in her recitations. And there are, if you've seen assignment one, there are several synchronization problems we ask you to solve on assignment one for real, in real code, right? So, you know, synchronization is like anything else. Practice makes perfect. So the more examples you walk through, the more chances you have to, to see these kind of acted out, the more likely it is that when you actually have to do this on a real assignment when it matters, you guys will be ready. OK? All right. So a couple of announcements. Assignment one is out. Hopefully everybody saw the email yesterday. Uh, and my oh, typos galore on this slide. Um, please get started on assignment one, right? Uh, the, the technique that many of you guys employ down assignment zero of waiting until the very last minute to start, I think, will not work as well on assignment one if it worked on assignment zero. If it didn't work on assignment zero, then you really have a reason to get started on assignment one. But even if it worked on assignment one, on assignment zero, I would suggest that you start this earlier. Because this is the first time this semester where we're actually going to ask you guys to write some real kernel code. And we're going to test that code for you. We're still kind of working out exactly how we're going to do the testing. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you more about that as, as kind of the assignment progresses. But for now, all the instructions that you need, all the requirements for the assignment are up on the website. And so you can get started with it. And at some point, we'll update you about exactly how to test your system and, and what we're going to require for that. Um, so again, as I announced on Wednesday, the Tuesday recitation has been canceled. The, third, the Wednesday recitation has been moved to Talbert 106, which apparently, according to the email I received, is a room that has technology. Right? I mean, at some level, all rooms have technology. Like, this is technology, right? This is older technology than we're used to talking about, right? But, but anyway, this, this room maybe has electronic technology, like something like a, like a projector, for example. Um, I've, I've moved my office hours partly, I shouldn't say partly, entirely because they conflicted with another meeting I had scheduled a long time ago, whoops. Uh, and also, that's it, I think. So we're done fiddling with this. I think this is what we're gonna, how we're going to rock for the rest of the semester. Um, and the website is your best source for all this information, OK? And I'm working on getting the slides and the video up there. You know, we're, we're, we're continuing to learn how to do that better and better as the semester goes on. Any questions about this? Has anybody started the assignment? Raise your hand. Were you able to, to, to get the sources that we updated? Yeah. OK, awesome. Because somebody was having a problem with that, and I wasn't sure if I, if I fat fingered it or botched it in some way. All right. So last time, uh, we kind of did this whirlwind tour of synchronization primitives. Uh, we started out talking about the trade-offs between spinning to wait for a resource and sleeping to wait for a resource. 
And then we went through locks, we talked about condition variables, and we talked about semaphores, right? And, and several of those introductions were a bit brief, so if you guys have questions, this would be a good time to ask. Of course, we're going to do our review. Anybody have questions about stuff that we talked about on Wednesday? Yes, up front. Yep. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, there, there's, a, there's a number of different ways to, to implement locks. Some, some of the uh, things that I've read when they talk about hybrid locks or hybrid mutexes, what they're, actu what they're actually referring to are, are mutexes that will spin on a multi-core system but will sleep on a single core system. Because remember, we talked about on a single core system, spinning is just almost never, ever a good idea, right? Probably categorically never, but I'm sure there's some corner case that I'm forgetting about, right? So, but yeah, I mean, you could, and, and if you wanted to implement that for, for your kernel, go ahead, actually. Uh, you know, one of the things I, I want to make sure I impress on people as you guys start, you know, programming in OS 161 is this is your system, and uh, you are free to build whatever extra functionality you want into this system. So there's, there are actually some things that students in the past have found helpful to do. Uh, one, one of them I'll just, that just came to my mind was that if you've looked, you've seen that we've given you uh, implementations of some kind of useful uh, container data structures, right? So there's a queue implementation that's used a few places. There's an array implementation that you may want to use. Um, I don't think, so maybe, maybe David has changed this, but for a long time, those implementations were not thread safe, meaning that they were not safe under concurrent accesses, right? And if you want to use those, those data structures with multiple threads, you might want to actually do the work to make them thread safe, right? To make them safe under synchronous, or under, you know, uh, interleaved access, right? And that might be something that helps you do later assignments, because you can imagine, I mean, one way of synchronizing access to a data structure is just to synchronize the methods that you use to access the data structure. And then people that use the data structure just get the synchronization for free, right? So that, that's just one, one example of something. But anyway, you know, don't think that the assignments are kind of where, we, where you have to stop, right? If you are solving a problem for assignment two and you think, hey, it would be really cool to have this different kind of lock, build a different kind of lock, you know? I mean, that, that's kind of what's fun about this class, right? This is your code base and the tests that we run, especially for assignment two and assignment three are just tests that things are working, right? And how you guys get that to work is totally up to you. So there can be times when the right thing to do is to actually build a new primitive. Right? Or build a new data structure, implement a data structure, or add some functionality to something that's already there. Right? And that might not be in the assignment, but it might be the best way for you to complete the assignment. Right? Any other questions about semaphore locks CVs? Yeah. So what are the uses of semaphores? Semaphores, yeah, yeah. So, so that's, that's, that's tricky, actually. And um, well, so I'm, I'm going to have, I have one example today of a, a, a use case for a semaphore. Right? that actually came up, and it's actually in your code tree now because I, I used it in the driver code for your synchronization problem. So we'll talk a little bit about it. In, in general, as I said before, uh, semaphores uh, with their semantics just don't always tend to lend themselves you know, in, in an obvious way to certain problems. Right? Uh, locks and condition variables are frequently a better choice. Right? But remember, semaphores are counters. So in cases where you have a counted resource, semaphores might be a good fit, right? Semaphores are also implemented by using locks. Uh, I mean, the, the semaphores can be implemented in a variety of ways, right? You can certainly, yeah, I mean, a, a part of the internals of a semaphore is a count, right? That count is shared by multiple people who are accessing the semaphore. One way of, of, of establishing a critical section that allows me to modify that count is to, to use a lock, right? Yeah, that's certainly true. All right, any other questions about primitives, locks, condition variables, semaphores. No other questions? Rob. <coughs> yeah, so why don't, why, why don't we come, can I answer that question later? So we're going to work through today an example uh, that uses condition variables. But in that example, there is a, a, a critical section that we will talk about, right? Yeah, the other thing I would encourage you to do is and you, you will need to do this for assignment one, go look at the implementation of semaphores that we've provided, 
right? So and semaphores are properly implemented in the kernel tree that we gave you. And if you look at the semaphore implementation, you should be able to identify the critical section, right? And the way that you, should, can, you can identify it is how, how well, let, me, let me ask, how do you think you would identify the critical section in the implementation of semaphores that we've given you? Right. Like I said, it's correctly implemented. So the critical section it has a lock, acquire and a lock release that, that bracket, right? And you should look at that and you should look at what's inside the critical section and you should, you should tell yourself, there's actually a big fat comment by David in there too, explaining a little bit about why locks are acquired and released in a certain order. So you should look at that and you should convince yourself, you know, why is this stuff in the critical section, right? As opposed to some of the other things that might be outside, right? Okay, other questions? So, okay, so, so, so please today, I, I tried to, I, I know I've been doing, I have getting this bad habit of, of jamming a little bit too much stuff into the lectures so that we have to kind of like go into turbo mode at the end. So I've, I've tried to avoid that today. I probably failed again. Um, but I, I don't think that I did a fantastic job of teaching the primitives on Wednesday. So if you're confused, it's my fault, but please stop me today, I'll slow down, and we'll, we'll come back to this stuff, right? You're also gonna learn this by doing it, right? So I, I feel a little bit like, okay, I, I'm off the hook. All right, any other questions about this stuff? Before we do our usual review. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work over here today. Okay, so spinning is almost never a good idea on a what? Single core system. Shh, I'm picking on people. You guys can't help out. Okay, single processor system, right? Okay, so when I, so, but, you know, let's say I'm on a multi-core system, so, I'm, I'm, I need to establish a critical section. I'm trying to decide whether I should spin or I should sleep, right? How do I make that decision? Uh, you spin if, it's <coughs> if the critical section is short and you sleep if it's long. That's right, right? So if I know that the critical section is short, I might consider spinning. I still might sleep, right? But I might consider spinning. And if I know the critical section is long, then it's almost always a good idea to sleep, right? All right, let's keep going here. Why? Ah, there's the tough one. Oh. <laughs> It's only three letters, but it's such a. T <laughs> so what happens if I sleep? But but how do I do that? What's the mechanism? Right. Sleeping is it means that the thread that's running is going to, going to what? Stop. Stop, and that means what? Well, what happens after that? Right, the processor just sit there doing nothing. It goes to a different thread. Right. So I have, and what do we call what do we call that? Context switch, and what did we say about context switches? Large overhead. It's expensive, exactly, right? So, if and and and, what am, and and the other question that's not up here is, when I have a critical section like this and I have multiple threads that are trying to bang their way into it, what am I trying to do? What's what's the goal, right? I've got a bunch of threads that are that need to go through this this little critical section, right? And you know, and if, to make the system more efficient, what 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 would I like to do? Well, that's, no, so that's, that's important for correctness, right? Only one thread can be in the critical section. But once that thread leaves, what do I want? The next thread to run through. As soon as possible, yeah. right? So I don't want the critical section, if I have a lot of threads that are trying to get into a critical section, I don't want that critical, you could think of the critical section as a, as a shared resource, right? And I don't want it to sit there idle because a bunch of other threads are sleeping. And so if I have a small critical section, it might make sense to spin because spinning might actually improve the throughput through the critical section, right? If I don't, again, if the critical section is short, the context switch overhead will waste cycles. If it's long, spinning is going to waste those cycles, right? Yeah? How long is long? <laughs> How far is east from west, right? Um, uh, that, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a design decision, right? I mean, it depends on how long the context switch overhead is, right? It might depend. So, so if I have a, and, and critical sections don't always have a fixed length, right? I mean, critical sections might have loops in them. They might have, you know, arbitrary control flow, right? So sometimes it, it, it can, now, I think one of the things about designing a good critical section is to try not to do that, right? Do as little as possible in the critical section and have the critical section be as predictable as possible, right? Because then you can, you know, you can choose a primitive that, that works, right? But in general, I mean, this is a trade-off that really depends on, on the sizes of other things. So I think I've successfully weaseled out of that question. Right. But, but I think the answer is really that it just depends, right? Are there questions about this? Yeah? How do we know the length of context switch and how Again, I mean, it really depends on the system. With, with, your, with your system, you can go and you can just, 
you know, I mean, you could profile the system and you can essentially count the number of instructions, right? So it's kind of from, essentially, what are the boundaries, right? So what, what, in, what starts a contact switch? It, what's that? No, but what initiates a contact switch? What, what are the two ways I can initiate a contact switch? Either a hardware interrupt, which might initiate, initiate a preemptive contact switch, or a thread might go to sleep and essentially ask to be stopped, right? So essentially, you know, I can, I can benchmark from when that happens, how many instructions are executed until I, that other thread is, begins to run, right? And that, that's going to include the overhead potentially for the scheduler, which we'll talk about next week, right? But it definitely includes the overhead to save all that state that I need to restart the thread the next time it begins running, right? I'm not going to call it constant. Right. It really, it, it might depend particularly on, on how much work the scheduler has to do or other things that are happening on the system, right? It's like something's about to collapse. Um, okay, what, what is the interface to the lock, to a lock? What, what, are, the, what are the two functions? Let's get sh one, one function back there. Yeah. What can I do to a lock? What's that? Yeah, a lock. I mean, what can I what can I do to it? What's the interface? Do you know? Do you, okay. <laughs> so this is it's important to understand what an interface is, right? Let's go forward, Robert. What's one of the things I can do to a lock? I can acquire it, right? I, I can I can call lock acquire. If the lock is available, I'll be granted it. If it's not, I'll be put to sleep, or maybe I'll spin, depending on what kind of lock it is. Okay. But when lock acquire returns, I have the lock. That's the semantics of lock acquire. What's the other thing I can do with a lock? Release it, right? Pretty obvious, right? And that's not true, actually. Whoops, bug on the slide. Release the lock. We'll not, lock release will not sleep. Ah, uh, don't look. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What are locks for? What are locks for? What, what, what's the primary purpose of a lock? Yeah. Protecting critical sections, right? That, that's, the, that's the most common use of a lock to protect a critical section, or to protect a piece of state, right, that's accessed in critical sections, right? Okay. What's the interface to a condition variable? Anybody remember? Let's see. Wait, signal, broadcast. Oh, man, I got that. I was going to try to, like, drip these out slowly, but I took all of them all at once. Okay. Right. So I can wait on a condition variable, which indicates that I'm waiting for the condition to change, I can signal, which means that the condition has changed and I want to wake up threads that, that are waiting on it. And signal will wake up one thread, right? And then there's also a way to broadcast to say to every thread that's sleeping on the condition variable, the condition variable has changed, right? OK. Now, what are condition variables for? I mean, we just talked about the interface. I mean, what, what does this sound like a good fit for? Over here. Yeah. So it allows me to convey more information than a lock, right? But, but, but again, I mean, con it condition variable, right? I mean, think about the name, right? What, what, is, what is the condition variable use, useful for? Right, if I'm waiting for a condition to change, right? If there's some condition that I want to essentially be able to wait for to change and to notify other people when, it, when it's changed, right? So when we come back to an example today to use condition variables, you'll see that there's a very clear condition that's, in this, in, in this, that's embedded in the statement, right? And you know, part of using condition variables is identifying what the condition is and identifying when the condition changes, right? Because when the condition changes is when you need to use one of these signal or broadcast mechanisms, okay? Yes, the signal changes to shared state. That's what I just said, kind of. Okay. Now, I actually didn't tell you this last time, but, it, but if you look at the interface in, in OS161 and in general, condition variables are always associated with a lock. Why? Can anybody figure this out? So it's condition variables to signal changes to shared state. Both are forms of state communication. That's true, but why would I always have a lock associated with a condition variable? So, so normally, the, the semantics of condition variables are, in order to call CV signal broadcast or wait, I actually have to pass the lock and I have to hold the lock, 
when I call those functions. Why? Yeah. Ownership. Okay, but that's that. So it means I have to be the owner. But what is the lock protecting? Signal itself. Right. This so condition variable signal changes to shared state. How do I protect shared state? Lock. With the lock. So the lock is there to protect the shared state. It means that because it, because again we'll see how to use CV weight, right? CV weight is normally used. Check a condition. If the condition isn't the way I want it to be, wait. In order to protect the condition from changing in between the time I check it and the time I call wait, I need to have a lock, right? That lock protects that condition from changing, from some other thread changing it, and me going to sleep, right? If that happened, I might never wake up, right? Because I might be waiting for a condition to change. The guy just changed it. I didn't get the signal, right? I didn't see the change to the state. I'm sleeping, and now he's gone, right? So that, so that, would, that would be a case where that would not be good, right? Lock protects the shared state that the condition variable allows me to signal changes to, OK? Semaphore interface. Anybody remember? P and V. So Carl? Carl came to my office, and, and we were having this discussion. He said, you know, I always struggle using semaphores. Is that OK to say? Sure. Yeah. Um, and I would say, and I have the same problem, and I think the problem is this stupid terminology, right? So it turns out, does anyone know why P and V are Dijkstra, used? Yeah, Dijkstra. It was Dijkstra, right? And Dijkstra, well, what was the problem with Dijkstra? The Netherlands, he was Dutch, yeah. right? So he spoke Dutch. <laughs> and, and it's funny, because we looked this up. It turns out that, so, so I was always taught that P is for proberen, which in Dutch means to test. And V was for something else that I forgot. Right? <laughs> Which means they you know to release or whatever. Apparently, according to Wikipedia, it's even worse than that. The, the word that Dijkstra said that P stood for isn't even a real word, right? <laughs> it's, a, it's what's called a portmanteau. It's a combination of two words that he made up, right? So not only was he speaking Dutch, but he was making up new things in Dutch, right? <laughs> um, but anyway, you know, P and, <laughs> P and B, like I, like I always have to stop and think, what do those mean, right? And it's, it's annoying, right? And, and we, could, we could just say, hey, Dijkstra, uh, thanks for your you know, legacy of incredible contributions to computer science, but we don't care about your stupid interface. We're going to call them up and down, and then we can all use them correctly, right? But, but I guess we did do that. But you can do that if you want to. You can, you can change your semaphores. You can change the semaphore interface. Just make sure you fix all the places where it's used. Um, <laughs> okay, so yes, P, decrement the semaphore. So semaphore is a shared a counter that, that I guarantee atomic access to. And the semantics of the semaphore are it cannot go below zero. So if I try to, to, uh, if I try to decrement it below zero, that decrement operation will have to wait until somebody else increments it. Right? Another, so another way of thinking about semaphore semantics is the semaphore is not allowed to go below zero. If I try to make it below zero, the system is going to stop me and say, nope. You cannot complete that operation until somebody calls V and increments. OK. So how are semaphores different from locks? So a binary semaphore. Let's say I have a semaphore that only is 0 and 1, and I don't only use the P and V. Yep. Uh, no sense of ownership. No sense of ownership, right? So a lock has an owner. And when, a lock, when, the, when, when you call lock release on a lock, one of the things that your lock release implementation should do is ensure that the lock, that the thread that is trying to release the lock is the one that holds the lock. And that's just, that's just a semantic requirement. And it's designed to make locks easier to use. And the fact that semaphores don't have that semantic requirement can make them more difficult. All right, any other questions about this stuff? Locks, CVs, semaphores. You guys are also going to implement reader writer lock, another synchronization primitive. And I will leave that to your reading of assignment one to figure out what those are. OK. So, let, so let's talk about some of the problems with locks. right? So up until now, we've, we've really kind of thought about, or maybe I've, I've been thinking about, I've been in this fantasy world where you know, uh, threads get one resource at a time. And in the real world, threads may need access to multiple resources. right? And, and locks may be used to protect those multiple resources. And so acquiring multiple resources may mean that I need to get multiple locks. And this is where we start to run into problems, OK? So let me walk through an example. I've got two threads, thread one and thread two. Nope, actually, there was threads A and thread B, OK? 
and they both need, they both need simultaneous access to resources one and two. Okay? So let's imagine that the following happens. Thread A1s grabs the lock for resource one. Okay? Bam! Context switch. Okay? Thread B runs grabs the lock for resource two. Bam! Context switch. Okay? Really, I have fun with that. Uh, but I'll stop now because I think people are starting to give me weird looks. Um, thread A runs tries to acquire the lock for resource two. Now, what will happen? It's going to wait. Let's say it goes to sleep. Right. Now what happens? Thread B runs, tries to get the lock for resource one. What will happen to thread B? It will also go to sleep. What is thread A waiting for at this point? It's waiting for thread B to wake it up, right? Thread A went to sleep and said, hey, you know, it's, it's, it's like if, if both of you got, it's, it's like, imagine you're in a class that's at 9 a.m. and you have a midterm, right? And you and a buddy decide to, to partner up. And you say, hey, you know, I'm going to call you at 8 o'clock to wake you up. And he says, I'm going to call you at 8 o'clock to wake you up. You guys both go to sleep. And nobody wakes up. Right? OK? So, so this is a condition that we call deadlock. And deadlock occurs when a, th a thread or set of threads are waiting for each other to finish, and nobody ever does. Right? And, and deadlock is always associated with what we just established here, which is a, a circular resource dependency. Right? So thread A has resource 1, is waiting for thread B, which has resource 2, which is waiting for thread A, which has resource 1. If you can't establish a cycle in your resource dependency graph, you cannot have deadlock. Right? And that's one of the ways that we use to fix this problem. Okay? Now, people might think, well, OK, you know, deadlock sounds really uh, you know, uh, like it's an interesting problem, but you know, thank God, if, I'm only, if I only have a single thread, I can't deadlock. Right? A single thread can deadlock. And I actually think, from my experience with this class, that a lot of times the deadlocks that you guys experience in this class are single thread or self deadlocks. How could this happen? How can a single thread deadlock? Ben? Um, they're going along and you acquire a lock. Yep. Oh, yeah, you got ahead of me. So I I in general, yes. Thread A requires, acquires resource one, and then thread A tries to reacquire resource one. OK? So th this is even worse. Now I have this little, tiny little loop here, where thread A is waiting for who to wake it up. Thread A, right? So this is not good. Now, again, it just, if I just state it this way, this seems totally inane, right? Like, why, why would anybody do this? Just this seems like this incredibly dumb programming bug, right? It's like, you know, if you set a variable to null and then try to dereference it in the next line of your code, right? Like, this, is, this is, just seems so stupid, right? What, why would this happen? Ben actually already told you. Did anybody hear what he said? Might not be an indirect call. It might, be, it might not be a direct call. Maybe indirect call. Right. So um, imagine that I have function foo, which needs access to resource one, which it's going to do by locking it. I have function bar, which also needs access to resource one. And while holding the lock to resource one, foo calls bar. And this happens on systems, and it happens especially when you have multiple people developing the system, and you're trying to, you know, you're, you don't want to know what bar does, right? As the foo developer, you just want to call bar and expect bar to do, you know, what you want it to do, right? What you don't realize is that bar needs exclusive access to one of the resources you're holding, and you calling it with a lock held means that you will self deadlock. So this, this, is pro this is not an uncommon thing to happen when you're writing complex systems code, right? And, and it might, might not be this simple. It might be foo calls, you know, baz, calls cab, calls cat, calls bar, right? So the function chains can get arbitrarily long here, right? Can we solve this problem, right? So can, can, we, get out of, can we get out of this situation? Remember, I mean, when you guys start to do, I alluded to this before, when you guys start to write code for OS161, there are two ways to solve problems like this, right? One way to solve a problem like this is to fix the code that's causing the problem. Another way to, what's another way to solve a problem like this? You could pass a lock to the second function, and the second function would verify that the owner, I'm the owner, and then we go to the So, so that's, that's an interesting idea. Uh, 
if, if you look in our code, in general, the locks that we've given you, the lock do I hold or call, there, there, so is, there's a function called lock do I hold, right? Using that in your code generally means that you're trying to do something bad, like dumb, right? There's only a couple of cases where that function is actually used correctly, and you guys are going to write one of them. But what about this, right? So wh wh what's part of the problem here, right? Locks, the lock implementation that we're talking about here, will, will self-deadlock, right? So if a thread tries to reacquire the same lock, it'll, it'll wait, right? Can I fix this? No. Robert. Well, but uh, let's not talk about programming solutions. Let's talk about semantics solutions. Okay? You have a guess? So, okay, I'm gonna t I'm gonna accept that answer, right? And I'm gonna I'm gonna go with it, right? So I I am gonna make the lock function return, right? I'm gonna allow the lock function to proceed if I already have the lock. But what am I gonna do? So, so that would be what would happen that would be bad, right? But what I can do is I can write a recursive lock implementation. And what a recursive lock implementation does is it says, I'm going to relax the semantics of locks. I can write a separate implementation. This is usually the right way to do this. Don't change the semantics of something that's already in use. Write a new lock that you can use in cases where the lock needs to be locked recursively at multiple levels of the function stack. So I can write a recursive lock implementation that says, if you already hold the lock, I'm just going to return. But what do I need to do to make the semantics of this sane? Right? Essentially, what I want to be able to do is lock a lock that I already hold, and I don't know that I already hold it, and then later I want to be able to release it. Right? So I'm going to end up with multiple calls to lock acquire. What do I want to make sure about lock release? When you release the call, the count is in the so I think from this murmur over here, we have the right answer, which is I need to make sure calls to lock acquire and release are paired. And the way I do that is I can use a counter inside the lock itself. So when I lock the lock multiple times, I, I, I essentially keep a depth on the lock, and I keep incrementing the depth. When I call lock release, if the depth is non-zero, I just re reduce the depth and return. So essentially, I can lock the lock at five different levels in the function stack. And then when the guy at the bottom calls release, the lock is actually not released. Because the guy, as I pop up the stack, everybody needs to call release again before the lock is actually released. So you, you can build this lock implementation. It's not that complicated. And there are cases in your kernel where it actually might work well. Right? But this is a way to solve, one way to solve the self-deadlock problem. All right. I already said that. OK. So let's talk about the conditions for deadlock. OK? There are, there are several conditions. One is that I need protected access to shared resources. Right? Which means that when I try to get a resource, I might wait. Right? If I don't have threads sleeping, I can have this deadlock, where multiple threads are sleeping waiting for each other. Second thing, I can't, in this system, resources are not preemptible. So we talked about the CPU being preemptible. What does that mean? Does anyone remember? When I preempt a thread who's running on the CPU, what do I do? I take, essentially what I'm doing is I'm taking the threat, the CPU away from the thread, and I'm giving it to somebody else, right? In, in our world that we've established here, resources are not preemptible. Once a thread grabs a lock, I can't tear the, that lock away from the thread and give it to somebody else, right? So that, that's what creates this problem, because if I could do that safely somehow, I could get out of this by essentially recognizing that there's a deadlock and, t and, and basically stopping one thread and saying, okay, these other threads could run, and then maybe I'll give it back to you later, right? So multiple independent requests is the fourth condition. It means that I'm allowed to hold one resource while I request another resource. Right? If I can't do that, I can't deadlock. All right? And finally, I need a cycle in my dependency graph. Right? I need to have some loop right, where I can establish that thread A is rated for B, C, D, and it has to loop back around. Okay? The reason that I bring these up is that if I relax any one of these conditions, then I cannot deadlock. So I need all four of these to deadlock. And so let's go through an example. So this is like this classic synchronization problem. 
You know, it's probably in the textbook and it's, it's discussed all of this. So this is you know, the dining philosophers problem. Imagine that I have these five people who were labeled on, on the web as modern philosophers. I have no idea who these guys are. And they don't look super modern, right? Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, I should know who some of those people are. Wow. My liberal arts education has totally failed. Um, OK, so and, and they're, they're, they're sitting down to eat. And each one of them needs two chopsticks to eat. The other thing I found when I was creating this graph, it is impossible to find a picture of just one chopstick. If you look for chopsticks online, every picture has two chopsticks in it, right? <laughs> so I made chopsticks using thick black lines, OK? And, and so let's, let's imagine what, what happens here. Let's say that my algorithm is I grab the chopstick on my left, and then I grab the chopstick on my right, OK? And, and, and what can happen here? Well, this guy gets this chopstick, this guy gets that chopstick, that old dude gets that chopstick, this guy gets that chopstick, that guy gets that chopstick. Everyone has one chopstick, right? And no one at this point is going to make any forward progress, right? Because they're all holding one chopstick, and no one is going to surrender another chopstick so that anybody can eat, right? So this is this classic sort of sad problem of, of, of the, the hungry philosophers, right? OK, so how, how do I get this, you know, how do I solve this problem, right? So breaking deadlock conditions normally, I shouldn't say normally, always requires finding a way to invalidate one of the, the things that are necessary for a deadlock to occur, right? So in this case, let's think about it, right? So the first thing is, remember, I had these resources that I was going to wait to acquire, OK? So the first condition is, if I can't grab the second chopstick, drop the first chopstick. Now, the locks that we've given you don't support this, right? Because there's no way to tell if the call is going to succeed, right? I just have to call acquire, and if the resource is held, I'm going to sleep, right? So this requires some sort of different approach to figuring out how to allocate these resources, right? Another idea is don't make multiple independent requests, right? So in that case, I was requesting one chopstick and then the other chopstick. So a solution to this is somehow figure out a way to get both of them at once, right? Maybe I lock the whole table and I grab two chopsticks and then I drop the lock on the whole table or whatever, right? So this would require some different approach to this problem than the one that we established. All of these do, right? Another way, so this is probably the one that would allow me to use what the, the idea that I've already tried here, right? If I can establish an ordering that allows, that, that means that cycles cannot occur, then I can avoid deadlock. So let's say I number the chopsticks at the table 0 through 4. And the semantics are that I always grab the lower number chopstick first. That cannot produce a cycle. I'll let you think about why. But what, what does it also mean? So if you remember, the philosophers all grab the chopsticks with their left hand first. Will, will this lead to the same approach? No. There will be one person at the table who, because of the ordering, so if I have chopstick 2 and chopstick 3, or let's say I have chopstick 3 and chopstick 2, I grab the left one, right? Everyone, everyone at the table will grab with one of their hands except for one guy, right, who will grab with the other. And it's that guy who allows this, this cycle not to deform, right? Because his first request will fail, and the other chopstick next to him, the other guy will be able to grab, right? So that will break this condition. And then the, the final solution is to just detect the deadlock and preempt one of the resources. Right? So imagine that you know, I, I, I see this condition, and I just go in and I whack one of the philosophers over the head. Right? <laughs> and he drops his chopstick, and then we can all, we can all go forward. Right? So that's another way to do this. And, and, this and, the, and the mechanism for doing this is really not clear. Right? So, and it's certainly not clear given any of the tools that, that what we've given you. But this is one thing you could potentially do. Okay? So let me talk about two other things in relation to deadlock. So, there's another problematic condition that you can run into, and you guys may experience this when you work on your reader-writer locks for assignment one. Right? So there's another uh, problem that also prevents forward progress, which is called starvation. And starvation is not deadlock. Right? In a deadlock system, no one will ever make forward progress. In a starvation condition, the activity of some threads is preventing other threads from ever acquiring the resource. Right? Meaning that you know, if, if, a, if a thread continues to show up, this other thread will never enter the critical section, right? Will never get access to the shared resource. 
And, and I'll, I'll leave you guys to thinking about how this works with reader writer locks because you, know, you, know, you need to be careful because badly built implementations of reader writer locks can starve writers. Okay? So one last observation about deadlock. What is better, deadlock or erase condition? Anybody, anybody want to take a position? Deadlock, why? Because the program stops, right? I'll choose the deadlock, right? Because I can tell when my system is deadlocked. And in some cases, deadlock, deadlocks occur because I'm actually being too conservative about my synchronization. I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm doing too much work to protect resources, right? I need to relax that a little bit, right? Whereas race conditions usually happen because I'm not doing enough. So in this case, go with the deadlock, right? You will, you will be able to tell if your system is deadlocked, and frequently deadlocks, you know, I mean, one of the best things that happens with deadlock is the system just stops, right? So you might have a chance to break in with the debugger and try to figure out what the threads are waiting for, right? All right, so let, let me do this. I'm behind as usual, so I'm not gonna, let me not do priority inversion. What I am gonna do is talk about, let me, let's go through an example together in the last 10 minutes. We'll do pr producer consumer using condition variables. Okay, and, and again, if, if, I, if I expect you guys to know priority inheritance, I'll record it and you guys can watch it online. Fair? Okay. So let's, let's go through solving an example synchronization problem using one of the primitives that, that we've discussed, okay? So producer-consumer, right? This is kind of a classic thing that might happen in an operating system. I have some set of threads that are producers, right? And they're, they're gonna put data into a buffer and then I have another set of threads that are consumers. Those threads are going to withdraw data from the buffer and, and do something with it, okay? The producers and consumers share a buffer. This is part of the shared state, right? And the semantics are that if the buffer is full, I can't produce into it. So whatever producer is trying to access the buffer will have to wait. If the buffer is empty, I can't consume from it. So the consumer will have to wait, okay? Other things, so whenever you solve these problems, one of the best things to do is start by figuring out what, you know, what are my requirements, and then what are other things that I, that I need to avoid, right? So for example, if there is room in the buffer, a producer should not be sleeping, right? A producer should not be waiting if there is room in the buffer. If I'm not careful, this can happen, right? And also, the equivalent condition, consumers should not be sleeping if there are items in the buffer, right? They, they, may, they, you know, they may sleep for a, a second, but they should always be woken up if there are items in the buffer. Right? They should not be sleeping for long periods of time while items sit there in the buffer. That's, that's, that's a problem. Now that problem, that might not make your solution incorrect, but it makes it not work the way I want. Right? As soon as there's items in the buffer, I want them to consume, and as soon as there's room in the buffer, I want there to be producers. Yeah, yeah. So pr producers are putting items into the buffer, consumers are withdrawing items from the buffer. Right? Let, me, let me put up the code, maybe it'll make more sense, okay? So, so here's my skeleton code. This is our starting point, okay? So I've got two calls, and, and assume that put and get are, you know, are, are, are work properly, okay? So my producer is passed an item and puts that item into the buffer. My consumer pulls, tries to pull an item out of the buffer and returns it, okay? So what is the first thing I need to do here? Right? What is the first piece of information about this system that I need to keep track of in order to establish the semantics that I want? What's that? Check whether the buffer is full. So uh, check whether the buffer is full. How do I tell if the buffer is full? Number of items in the buffer, right? So I need a count of how many items are in the buffer. Right? This count is going to allow me to figure out whether the buffer is full, empty, or in between. And depending on the state of the buffer, I'm going to do different things, okay? Now that I've got the shared state, what do I need to do? I need to lock it, but I also, right now I don't need to lock it, right? Because I'm not doing anything to it. So once I have the shared state, what's the first thing I need to do? When I put, when I produce, when I put something into the buffer, right, what do I need to do to the count? Increment. Increment, right? Yeah, I mean, until I start changing variables, I don't need, so I don't need to lock count right now, right? Because count is never accessed, right? So the first thing I need to do is I need to, uh, oh, actually, sorry, okay. So, so let, me add, let me add a variety of things to this, right? So I, I do need to update count, okay? This is a limitation of my slides right now. Things come in order on the slide, okay? And then the point is that if I'm trying to produce into a full buffer, I need to 
to, I can't do that, right? Something else has to happen, right? So if I'm trying to produce into a full buffer, I need to do something, okay? And then the equivalent for the consumer. If there's nothing in the buffer, I can't consume. I have to do something else, okay? And I need to update the count on the buffer, right? So, so this example kind of, you know, if, if it was, you know, in certain conditions, this example might actually work, even if I just spin, right? But you had a great idea about something to do here, right? So what do I need to do to count now? No, no, I've got that, right? But what was your, what was your original suggestion? Right, I need to protect the count, okay? So I, I need to lock around the count, and then, and then but, but I already gave this away, right? But, but what synchronization primitive is a good fit for this? A semaphore? Okay, that's, a semaphore would be one vote. Anyone else want to vote for something else? I, I, I'm gonna, I, I need a lock for the count for sure, count a shared state. A condition variable, why? Right. I have three conditions here, right? I have a buffer empty condition, in which case something has to happen or not happen. I have a buffer full condition, in which case something has to happen or not happen. And I have the buffer in between condition, in which case something has to, multiple things can happen, okay? So I'm gonna solve this using condition variables, right? And, that, and, and, and also, remember, I have a variable too. I have a variable and it's conditions on that variable, right? So this is a classic example of this. I have a count, right? That's my variable, and I have conditions. This is one condition, this is the other condition, okay? All right, so let's talk about how to do this with the CV. So first, I need a CV, right? But what else do I need here? A CV is always associated with a lock, right? And, and as someone pointed out, I need the lock anyway because I have shared state. I need to lock around count. So even if I wasn't using a CV for whatever reason, I would still need to protect count somehow, right, from, from this multiple access. Okay, so now I'm, so I definitely need to lock around my access to count, right? So I'm gonna add, well, actually, let's see here, okay? So, so again, this is kinda gonna go faster than I want to, right? So let's look at what the producer is gonna do, okay? So I have, so as, as Robert, you asked before, right? Can I give an example of a critical section? Right? Here it is an example of a critical section. Right? I have a shared variable count that's accessed by multiple threads, either multiple threads running one produce or multiple threads running a mixture of produces and consumes. Right? I, I'm testing the count here and I'm changing the count here. Okay? And in order to do that safely, I need to lock around this entire section. Right? Okay? Similarly down here, right? I'm testing the count here and I'm changing the count here. So I'm gonna lock around that, that entire section as well, okay? Now I'm using a condition variable, and one of the conditions is I'm testing right here. So for my producer, if the buffer is full, I'm gonna wait, okay? And on my consumer, if the buffer is empty, I'm going to wait, right? And the semantics of CV wait are that CV wait will drop, essentially CV wait if the condition, you know, CV wait will drop the lock, right? Because here I hold the lock when I call CV wait. When CV wait returns, it returns with the lock held, okay? So when I check the condition again right here, I still have the lock, right? If CV wait didn't return with the lock held, I'd have to acquire it again. But because CV wait returns with the lock held, I can write this, right? So CV wait drops the lock, goes to sleep. When it's awakened, returns back to the thread with the lock held. So I can check the count again safely. All right, so we're done, right? This looks good. Is this, is this correct? It looks good to me. I mean, you know, I'm updating the count. You know, I use the CV to go to sleep, and uh, yeah, this, this, should, this should just work, right? How will we wake up? Oh my gosh, this is not good, right? So, yes, this is the problem here. If you call CV wait, you had better broadcast on that CV or signal on it somewhere, right? Because otherwise, those poor threads that are waiting on this condition will never wake up, right? 
So CB weight and signal broadcast are similar to lock, and, to lock acquire and lock release in that they have to be paired, right? So if you, if you start using condition variables, you need to think, where do I wait, where do I signal, right? Or broadcast. Okay, so where? So where? Now, where, do I, where am I going to put these? So I need, I need, to, I need to tell the threads that, to, that are sleeping to wake up. Where, where do I do this? More specifically, before I release the lock, but why right there? Because I changed the count, right? Remember, the count encapsulates the condition that these threads are waiting on, right? The condition does not change unless the count changes. And if the count changes, I need to tell people about it, OK? Where does the condition change? The condition cha can potentially, potentially change here or here, right? That's when I'm adjusting the count. So let's put in some broadcast there. OK, now I've got a CV broadcast. So I up to count, and I broadcast. And I, when I deck the count, I broadcast, OK? Does this work? Yes. This actually does work. And it says so on the slide. So good, reading comprehension. Does it work well? Why are you broadcasting that OK, so, so that's, that's a good question, right? But let me ask another question. When, when does the condition, what are the conditions that I'm checking for, right? This condition is checking something very specific, right? If the count is equal to a particular value. And this guy is also checking something very specific, if the count is equal to a very specific value, right? Now, this will work. But what will happen is when I broadcast, let's say the count is going from, you know, um, well, in, in that case, I guess I wouldn't have people waiting, right? So this actually probably would, would work, right? But one of the things I might want to do here is actually check if the count has changed in a way that changes the condition, right? So here, what I've done is I've said, if the count is equal to 1. So the buffer used to be empty. And now it's not empty. So the buffer has gone from empty to in between. And down here, what I'm checking is, did the buffer, was the buffer full? Right? So in this case, the buffer went from full to not full. Right? If I don't do that, I can still do this. And this will work fine. Right? But what should happen is CV broadcast will get called. And if the count up here went from 1 to 2, there shouldn't be any threads waiting on the buffer being empty. So the broadcast is just not needed, right? And same thing down here. If the count goes from you know, half to half minus 1, there shouldn't be any threads sleeping waiting to produce, right? So the CV broadcast is just unnecessary. So I can get rid of that. So we had a question here. Why do I CV broadcast? Why can't I call CV signal? And oh, man, in the, in, the in the two minutes I have left, it's a good question, right? And the reason is that. So let's say I have a situation where I have multiple consumers, right? Now, so especially now that I've added this condition, right? I'm only going to, so let's say I have three, sorry, let's say I have three producers that are waiting because the buffer is full. I have one thread that comes through here and sees that the buffer went from full to not full. If he calls signal, right, what might happen is only one of these guys will wake up, right? But there's three of them waiting. And they all need to wake up, right? Because it's possible that there's uh, several other calls to consume that are going to change the count but are not going to broadcast, right? Because I've added this condition here to avoid having to CV broadcast, right? Because they're essentially probably like waiting on different conditions, right? Like one is waiting for conditions to be full, another one is waiting for conditions to be empty. So I don't think that would ever happen, right? I, I don't know. It's, I, I think that would violate one of our assumptions. Now, I think, I haven't thought about it carefully, but I think. In this example, you could replace CV broadcast with CV signal. And that would work, I think. But I'd have to think about it harder. But in this case, CV broadcast is the right thing to do, simply because, again, I could have you know, three producers coming in and a bunch of consumers waiting. Only one producer is going to call broadcast. I need all my consumers to wake up. OK. Uh, uh, yeah. In the previous slide. Yep. But the point is that there might be another thread right behind me who's putting more stuff in, right? So, so it, multiple, uh, multiple multiple consumers. Well, yeah, that's, that's the example we have here, right? We always have multiple threads that could be calling these in any order. 
So if I have a bunch of producers stacked up and only one of them is going to call broadcast, I need to make sure all the consumers wake up. So it's possible by the time the first consumer runs, there could be three items in the buffer. But if only one item is there in buffer and uh, all three wakes up? No, no, but my point is that it's possible that by the time they wake up, several other producers would have put more stuff into the buffer, right? I don't know how the threads are scheduled. It's possible that I call broadcast, and these guys wake up, but they may not run right away, right? They may just be added to the ready queue, and before they get a chance to run, several other producers come through and put more things, right? Okay, I'm, I, will, I will leave this in the examples. Robert. Can we call through that particular Yeah. So, so right, this, this example doesn't, doesn't treat the buffer at all, right? You're just assuming that put and get work, okay? Let me, let me I'm not going to do the semaphore example, but you can look at this. This is, there's an example in your code base in the drivers of, of a case where you can use the semaphore to do something useful, okay? But let me quickly just summarize what we did today, because this is important, this will help you on assignment one and when you think about synchronization problems, right? So when you approach these problems, right, what's the approach that we took? First of all, you have to figure out what do you expect to happen, right? What are the constraints? Remember, a race condition is always defined in terms of unexpected dependence on timing. So you have to figure out what do you expect, okay? That was the first thing that we did. Second thing, identify shared state in the problem, right? It, it's, it, it can be a good idea to build an implementation that's not thread safe, either in pseudocode or real code, and then look at it and say, okay, here are pieces of shared state that I need to, to, to synchronize, that I need to protect. Third thing, choose a primitive, right? Choose a primitive. This is really important, and if we had done this with semaphores, we could have got it to work. It would have not been as nice. Um, and I, I'm, I actually can, I can send out an example using semaphores so you can see that. Um, Fourth thing, remember to pair waking and sleeping, right? If you call acquire, you have to call release. If you call s wait, you have to call, have a call to signal or broadcast, right? Because wait will potentially sleep and acquire will potentially sleep, right? And if you don't drop, one, I mean, one of the best ways to deadlock a system is to just not drop a lock. Like, whoops, I forgot to release it, right? That, that, that no, no one else will ever wake up, right? Look out for multiple resource allocations. Right? This can be tricky because the system could potentially deadlock. A good way to do it is to establish semantics that say, this is the order in which I lock these resources. And every thread that locks them has to lock in that order. You don't have to lock all of them. You could lock a subset, but as long as you follow an order and you cannot deadlock. Right? And finally, you know, it's a really nice thing to just convince yourself because it can, synchronization can be tough. Right? You can have race conditions that only occur in one out of a million different thread interleavings. Right? And you may not see those. And like I said before, Murphy's Law dictates that we will see them when we test your assignment, right? So especially the corner cases. So in our example, what are the corner cases? When the buffer goes from empty to not empty. When the buffer goes from full to not full, right? If I have a bunch of people trying to produce and a bunch of people trying to consume and the buffer is changing states, right? So go through those examples and convince yourself that your system is doing the right thing, right? All right, so next week we're going to keep going with, uh, with our CPU unit. Last bit of it, we're going to talk about scheduling, right? So scheduling, we've been talking about all these mechanisms, scheduling is policy, and then if we are really lucky, we'll get to my favorite topic, which is virtual memory, and I will see you on Monday. Have a great